Okay. So let's get started again. Uh, my name is Jennifer Dill. I'm a faculty member in Urban Studies and Planning um, and Director of the Center for Transportation Studies that sponsors this seminar. This is the first week of the quarter, and we do offer this seminar as a class, so I have some uh, logistical stuff I need to um, talk about briefly uh, that's class-related before we get started on the seminar. We'll also do some introductions around the room so our speaker knows who's here um, and we have an idea of the audience. Um, so those of you who are taking this as a class, either in civil engineering or urban studies and planning, I handed out some syllabus, syllabi. If you still need one, you can raise your hand and I'll get it to you. Um, please just read through the syllabus. Um, it's, the requirements are pretty clearly stated there. The key thing to remember for today is that we really want you to ask a question of the speaker, and that's part of your grade. Um, attendance is also part of your grade, and I'm going to be sending around a sign-in sheet that you need to sign in um, to know that you're here. Um, so just read through that briefly, and I think all your questions should be answered. Um, so why don't we right now do some quick introductions around the room, and I will also remind people or tell you for the first time perhaps that we do webcast these seminars, which is why I have this microphone in front of me that is not projecting. It is uh, projecting out on the web. Um, so people watching on the web can hear what we're saying. So um, when you ask a question, uh, we want you to use the microphones that are on the desks in front of you. You hold the touch button, you keep the red light lit. That means that it's working and recording your question so people can hear and try to speak relatively closely to it. There are some desks that don't have microphones or have microphones that don't work. And for the first time, we're going to try this portable mic and I'll play the Phil Donahue or whatever and try to get it over to you um, to use. And we'll see how well that works because we've had complaints from our web viewers that they can't hear the questions. So we want to hopefully solve that. Um, so. Uh, why don't we go ahead, just introduce who you are in an affiliation or, you know, just interested public or however you want to briefly uh, describe who you are. And since there's no microphones here, I'll start with you. And uh, Bob Kellett, I'm just a bike commuter in Portland. Jennifer Karps, also a bike commuter. You guys get to use the microphone. Kirsty Hall, Office of Transportation and also a keen bike commuter. Jason McNeil, I'm a community development major. Nicole Austin, and I've applied for the MERP program. Uh, Eric Seiler, I'm a cyclist. Chris Muntz here, faculty member in civil environmental engineering. Ross Stewart, CE, civil engineering engineer. Terrence Conlon, a bike commuter with the U.S. Geological Survey. Fang Zhou, I'm a community development major. I'm Ken Scatch, I'm also a bike commuter with the U.S. Geological uh, Ryan Gratzer, staff at PSU's Initiative for Bike Ped Innovation. Uh, Ivan Perez, a civil engineering student here at Portland State. Diane Morehouse, civil engineering student. Amit student in civil engineering. Scott Lotus, uh, very interested in transportation. Uh, my name is Matthew Yake. I'm a bike commuter and I work with Multnomah County Libraries. Ray Delahanty, Master of Urban and Regional Planning student. Katie Yuri, a curious neighbor. <laughs> Molly Cole, a public health major. My name is Leah Tomlinson. I'm a master student in civil engineering. Lisa Derrickson, master student in civil engineering. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Javier Spiker, CE undergrad. My name is Denver Igarda. I'm with the Portland Office of Transportation. Let's see if yours works. No. Okay, just speak loudly. Uh, my name is Billy Taylor, and I'm applying for the Urban Design Graduate Program. Jay Higgins, Mark Student. Byron Estes with Portland Development Commission and the Bike Community. Brandon McVeigh, CE undergrad. Donnie Jorgensen, CE undergrad. Antoine, graduate student, civil engineer. I have a lot to give. I'm a graduate student, civil engineering. Christy Gladhill, graduate student, civil engineering. Julie McDougall, I work for Alta Planning and Design. Bree Becker, I work for Alta Planning and Design. 
Karen Vickney, cyclist, designer with all the planning and design. Kim Boros with all the planning and design and Merp student. Roger Gellar with Portland Office of Transportation. Janet Tracy, bike commuter and geography major. Keith Brackett, bike commuter and geography graduate student. Welcome everyone and now you've all have practice with the microphone so you'll remember when you ask your question to use it or I'll try to rush over for those of you who don't have it. So let's get on with why you're all here um, which is to hear our speaker Steve Durant um, who is a senior associate with Alta Planning and Design um, a firm here in the Portland area. He's going to be talking about cycling in London um, based on some experiences he's had there over the past year. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. And uh, as she mentioned, I worked with uh, Alta Planning and Design. A little bit of background for since some of you are students, maybe looking for a career. Uh, I'm a landscape architect. I've got about 30 years since I graduated, I guess, from master's program. Uh, undergraduate Minnesota, master's in uh, landscape architecture also from uh, University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, so I've been a bicycle commuter since uh, ninth grade, I guess, basically. Uh, maybe 50 or 80 percent of the time, something like that, in the last several years, maybe the last 10 or 15 years, even more regular than that. And uh, it's been a great way to get around. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, cycling organizations in England and in London. And uh, the format's going to be kind of a review of my little notebook that I kept in uh, uh, London this summer. I spent about a month, most of it in London, about a week in the countryside, and then uh, about a month in London. And uh, I interviewed a number of uh, organizations, mostly nonprofits uh, in uh, London and the kind of southern England. Some of them serve all of the country and some of them just serve London to talk to them about how they go about what their mission is and how they go about promoting uh, cycling in, in England in general and spe uh, specifically in London. And it's kind of, it's pretty interesting because there are a number of cycling organizations and uh, so we'll go, kind of go through it a little bit at a time. Uh, the first one, and I'm going to go from kind of big picture down to uh, more big picture geographically. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because their budgets are sort of inverse, but big picture geographically down to very specific uh, London in particular. And then at the end, if we have some time, we'll talk a little bit about some of the facilities that actually we're talking about here in uh, Portland, some of the ideas that were coming that are very well developed in Europe. You've heard the whole story, but uh, graphically, it's very interesting in London because they really do use a very graphic kind of means of communication to people. So if we have some time, we'll look at those a little bit as well. And hopefully you'll have questions, and feel free to interrupt me as I go. I usually do better uh, kind of filling in some of the gaps uh, when people have questions to prompt me versus me trying to go with a script, which I really haven't got. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Cycling England, which is a policy and a funding partnership between a number of government agencies. It replaces a former uh, uh, board, strategy board, uh, and it's only a few years old, The uh, Cycling England is. Uh, so we'll get into a little bit more detail on that. Sustrans is a nationwide uh, organization that uh, celebrated 30 years uh, last year. It's what they call a charity, a nonprofit, non-governmental organization, and it serves uh, all of Great Britain, including Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Uh, and their big uh, claim, we'll talk about this a little bit, their big uh, fame is for the cycling network, which is really truly uh, remarkable all across the country, but they have a, a pretty wide um, uh, portfolio. We're going to talk about CTC. This is the uh, Cycle Touring Club. Uh, they're trying to rebrand into being called CTC. Uh, it is 120 years old, 130 years old, something like that. 
1878, they have 70,000 members across all of uh, Great Britain. Uh, they're obviously big promoters of uh, cycling, and we'll get into what their kind of mission statement is. Cycle Training UK is another, these are all nonprofits now except for cycle, uh, Eng Cycling England. CTUK is a service provider. They uh, deliver uh, training services to people across the country, and they have some really uh, interesting goals, uh, and their their mission is really to increase cycling uh, by making uh, confident, trying to help make confident riders out there. They're not really interested in the infrastructure. It's like I asked them, I asked uh, him some infrastructure questions, and he said, "You know, there are other people dealing with that. We're dealing with trying to make cyclists." And I thought that was kind of an interesting point that. Uh, we might learn from here a little bit on how they, uh, at least some of these organizations are kind of segmenting their emphasis or their focus. The London Cycling Campaign, this gets a little bit closer to, uh, you know, narrower uh, uh, geographically to just the London area. Uh, they've got uh, about 8,000 members in all 30 boroughs, and they're also about 30 years old this year, uh, and they've got some really wonderful products that they've put out there and, and initiatives. <clears throat> and then there is the local government uh, agency, transportation agency, which is Transport for London. Uh, and there were times when the distinctions between all of these organizations, including Transport for London, got pretty blurry. Who's putting out design guidelines? Who's pushing uh, various agendas? Uh, was kind of interesting uh, because uh, they really mix up their um, uh, approach to how they try to get more people cycling. So uh, Cycling England, remember this is the uh, kind of policy partnership and it uh, was created, their mission statement is really simple, more people cycling more safely more often and you see it on all their stuff and it's a wonderful very simple mission statement. Uh, it's sort of uh, you know motherhood and apple pie to a certain extent but What's interesting about this organization is it's a partnership between transportation, health, the environment, education, food and rural affairs, culture, sport, and the office of the deputy prime minister. These are all uh, federal or national uh, departments. So food and rural affairs, anybody have an idea why they would be interested in cycling? Tourism, in part, sure. Uh, it's also, uh, England is really the seat of the uh, slow food movement. You know, eating, buying, doing stuff locally. And I, I think that kind of uh, ties in there as well. So I, I thought this was really interesting that these, that the department heads or high up executives in these, what are there, like seven uh, departments get together in this partnership to create policy and channel funding for cycling. Uh, I, I think we could really learn from that. Some of the discussions that we have, we're working with the Metro government right now on uh, looking at um, trail uh, prospects over the next 20 years or something like that in the Metro region. And a question often comes up, is this a recreation resource that we're talking about now or a transportation uh, you know, infrastructure improvement? And there are some people that are still sorting their uh, funding streams based on the, those, you know, is this a transportation or a recreation or, you know, what's the purpose for this? Whereas this group, which is really trying to pull all of the players together, uh, I think has less, uh, it makes funding available for, for all kinds of um, interests that those different departments would have. So uh, they coordinate the developing of cycling and cycling infrastructure and cycling programs all across the country. Uh, it was established in 2005, like I mentioned, and it replaces the National Cycling Strategy Board, and I'm not quite sure who, who made that up. They've got five, so let's see. Oh, here we go into my notebook. So um, really the, the you know, soundbite that I got from 
uh, the person that was telling me about this was that it helps the government decide how to spend money for cycling, which is a great kind of clearinghouse uh, to a certain extent. They've got five uh, program themes that they look at, uh, training and schools cycling. We're going to talk a little bit about that. One of the things they did was help was establish the bikeability program, and we'll talk about that, and I have some kind of interesting props that I was able to talk them out of. Kind of a funny story there, too. Uh, they provide support for local providers, so that's sort of like the federal DOT here supporting the metropolitan planning organizations and their um, distribution of funds. They have demonstration towns, cycling demonstration towns, uh, which I suppose would be kind of like our non-motorized transportation pilot programs. We've got four of them in the country right now. Uh, and then also, uh, is it uh, Biking Magazine has their uh, cycle town kind of program. Uh, the public health program, so you've heard a lot about active living and active transport. They're really trying to encourage people, kids as well as adults, to get out and uh, use bikes and walking to get around. Um, and then uh, they also provide, Cycling England also provides marketing support and communications opportunities for the non-governmental organizations as well as local uh, organizations that want to get information out there. So I mentioned uh, bikeability. Uh, this was characterized as sort of a logo uh, for public training. It's really the, the front end for uh, the training program. And um, we'll see a slide about this a little bit later, but bikeability is a, a national standard for uh, cycle training. Since maybe the 30s, I think it was, England had uh, a program which was basically cones in the parking lot and they had a real kind of strict, rote uh, educational thing for kids, I think it maybe even started at second or fourth grade or something like that, to learn how to bike, uh, how to cycle. Uh, and it was completely taught by uh, volunteers. So the, and there was no certification or training really for volunteers. It was kind of a, you know, kind of a Cub Scouts thing to, in, in a way. So what they did just a couple of years ago, and it really just got published uh, very recently uh, was create this bikeability program, which is a, kind of a certification. It's a whole curriculum and certification system for trainers and trainers of trainers so that there's a consistent uh, delivery of cycle training across the country. They're really concentrating on elementary school students, <clears throat> but there are opportunities for middle and high school students and uh, custom programs for adults that you can do through uh, your workplace or uh, some communities actually sponsor um, training programs as well. And the whole mission is to give people confidence in getting out and cycling. Mostly cycling on the road, frankly. They're trying to get people to use uh, bikes as uh, an alternative, as their number one alternative for getting around. Um, so uh, and part of what they're doing, it's a cycle promotion activity, but part of what they're doing is really trying to teach people to make sensible decisions in their cycling as they're driving, as they're uh, biking along versus a uh, rote reaction to whatever the situation is. So they're trying to create pe uh, confident uh, riders. And I've got some interesting photos uh, from uh, cycling in uh, London that you'll see why they need confidence in kind of some of the situations that they're in. So uh, one of the things that uh, they mentioned is they want people to gain a l this cycling as a life skill, a lifetime skill, sort of like learning to swim, which I thought was kind of a, an interesting, um, very graphic kind of um, description of it. So Sustrans was established in 1977. So it's, it uh, was celebrating 30 years uh, when I was there. And it's also a nationwide organization. One of the things that they're best known for is uh, a 10,000 mile network that passes within a mile of half of the population of the UK. That's a lot of miles and uh, very good accessibility. Um, 
Indiana has a, right now has a program where they're trying to get an off-road trail within six miles of everybody in the state. Uh, so having an off-road trail or part of the network, they're not all off-road actually, part of the network within a mile of half the population is pretty good. Last year, it carried 232 million journeys, and that's been uh, close to an average for uh, quite a while. Half of those were by pedestrians. Uh, the network, growth of the network has been about 15% per year. That's growth of traffic on the network as well as the kind of length uh, or the, the roadways and, and trails that are being added to it. Uh, so there's lots of demand. And they tie this into some of their other uh, objectives, which include making links to schools and uh, connections from schools to the network so that uh, kids can use the cycle network to get to school or to get from one community to another. Uh, so one of the things that they're you know, really pretty well known for is uh, uh, design guidelines, and uh, and uh, this is a a notebook that actually it's a, pr a press proof. You can see from the photo there; it's got the the printing marks on it that it wasn't even trimmed yet. Uh, for a design guideline for 79 projects, and we'll talk about this in just a little little bit. Design guideline and project descriptions uh, for 79 projects for the Connect Two program which we'll talk about in just a minute. But it's, uh, they're very thorough in how they approach their, uh, their projects. So the National Cycle Network, uh, they've got a, a long laundry, laundry list here, which is kind of interesting. And they've, like I said, have been around a long time. We visited with them in 85 when we were there, and again in 90 or something like that. And they've got, you know, just great. They've got 200 people, 200 employees work for Sustrans. Their annual income is about 26 million pounds, 35,000 supporters. They're hoping this year to increase that by like 15% to 45,000 supporters. Now, I'm not sure if it's a membership organization, although you can send in, um, uh, you can send in, you know, a donation. They don't really have a membership category. Their funding comes from these 35,000 supporters, grants from charitable trusts and companies, the National Lottery, so they get a lot of money there, and we'll talk about Connect2, which is in part um, a lottery distribution. There's a landfill tax credit scheme. Local and central uh, governments uh, pitch in, and uh, non-governmental public bodies and the European Union. The EU is pretty interesting, uh, plays an interesting part in um, transportation policy and funding to a certain extent in England. So you can see this kind of list of some of their initiatives. Uh, there are, a lot of them are quality of life. Smart travel is a pretty interesting one that uh, actually Portland's doing quite a bit of, it. Indiv individualized travel marketing. And they're really trying to change people's uh, behavior and how they uh, get around. So they call it smart travel. Um, I think we call it smart trips, but smart travel. And uh, they're seeing reductions between 10 and 13 percent in traffic based on uh, this kind of individualized marketing. And they're saving, and in part, it's, to, it's a congestion thing and health thing, but also there's a big carbon, uh, much larger carbon um, footprint sort of uh, awareness in England and in Europe in general than here. Active travel, safe routes to schools, uh, art in the landscape. Uh, that's an interesting one that we don't see much of here. They've got an art program where they're trying to really incorporate uh, art projects of all different types into their uh, national cycling network. And the list goes on. The low carbon travel that I was just uh, mentioning, they have a big international um, um, or um, kind of awareness, uh, cooperative policy development, mostly in the EU. They, didn't, uh, they don't really do much looking this way uh, to the U.S. Uh, they provide technical assistance outside of England, and they are also looking to other countries with great mode share to figure out, to learn from them 
uh, things like wayfinding and other, their research goes much further than uh, just in the, in the EU. And then this is kind of an interesting one, I think. You know, the uh, Summer Olympics are coming to London in 2012. And uh, GOAL is an acronym for Greenways for the Olympics in London. They're using the uh, Olympics sort of like they use the turn of the millennium as a kind of a goal, a, a date, a landmark to try to hit to get uh, things done. Uh, the millennium was a great kind of excuse for all sorts of projects, in, especially in Europe. But uh, the Olympics is really an England and a London deadline uh, to for a number of projects. And this one is uh, really they are planning to connect all of the venues, and the venues are all over England, or I mean all over uh, the London kind of region. They're trying to get uh, off-road connections between all of those venues and, and downtown and the kind of major um, shopping and uh, residential and hotel districts all across uh, London. So it's a convenient deadline coming up because they're going to have so many millions of people visiting uh, London for the Olympics. But their pitch is it's going to be convenient for the Olympics. But look at this great infrastructure that we're going to be creating for London that's going to go on and help our quality of life long into the future. A lot of communities around the world look at the Olympics as a real flash and then they're paying for it forever. And you know what do they really get out of it? This is part of the sort of um, incentive that was created to help make the Olympics continue to pay off. So uh, <coughs> Matt Winfield is the fellow that I met with there. He's the kind of regional director in London. was a really great, really great contact. <coughs> so I want to talk a little bit before we go on to CTC. Let's see. The Connect 2 I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, there was there's sort of a some kind of a lottery that the people in England get to do like an online voting for how it gets spent. <laughs> so last fall, and there's been a build a big build up to it. Last fall, they decided that Connect Two, which was Sustrans' um, uh, big program, uh, was going to be the winner. And I forget what the other two were. There's a really kind of cool YouTube video on Sustrans' uh, uh, website that tells you a little bit about what the other two competitors were. But anyhow, people voted for Connect2, which connects, it, which works with, it's a 50 million pound lottery, and uh, Sustrans got commitments from communities across the country to match that with 100 million pounds in local funding. So 150 million pound uh, fund for a five-year project. So there's you know pretty pretty quick sort of implementation there. 79 communities and a lot of these uh, projects are really important um, barriers that are being uh, breached through this program. Their bridges and their connections uh, across. Uh, rivers and lakes and freeways and fixing interchanges and they're big barriers that are the really tough thing to fund locally and to kind of get done. It is a big chunk of what they're uh, working on there. 54 of those 79 projects are walking and cycling bridges. Um, some of them create footpaths and one of them is a ferry, kind of reinstating a ferry. And you can see the projects are in uh, all across uh, Great Britain, Northern Ireland. This always kills us. Uh, they don't show the rest of Ireland on, some, on lots of maps of England. But anyhow, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England all get uh, projects. Uh, and they, they went through a long process. I'm not sure when it started, but they went through a long process to establish when the, uh, or, or what the projects would be. And they're very well detailed. So really, this month, they're going to start uh, detail design, and very soon they're going to be building some of these projects. Some of them were probably you know, designed and on the shelf waiting for funding to come around, and so now they're being funded. By the way, on the, on the 
slideshow, I'm, I've got the web address for all of these organizations if you want to sketch that uh, <coughs> down or come and visit it later. Um, so the Cycle Touring Club, CTC, and they really made a point of telling me that they're trying to uh, rebrand uh, so that they're not thought of as a cycle recreation organization so much. So the CTC is uh, 1878 was when it was founded. A national organization, actually they spun off kind of a small, <clears throat> small group that they didn't really have a lot in common with after a while. They were kind of working at cross purposes. And the group that they spun off is the Automobile Association, which, you know, but it's like our AAA. But he was the fellow that I was talking to, um, his card's coming up, uh, was kind of proud of that, that they were, the, that they spawned the Automobile Association. So their mission is to make cycling enjoyable, safe, and welcoming for all. It sounds pretty, you know, familiar in a way. Rob Fuller was the fellow that I talked to. Um, and uh, Roger Geffen, they have actually a pretty big staff as well. And I didn't write down uh, how many people they have working for uh, CTC. Uh, their real mission is to conduct high-profile campaigns on the part or on behalf of uh, cyclists, of all cyclists. They're the ones that really developed the bikeability uh, scheme, the accreditation program that I was talking about. The Cycling England sort of said, yes, this should be done, and here are the, the kind of, here's the big picture goals for why you should be doing it. And CTC are the ones that actually uh, established the uh, curriculum and the training scheme and how it gets delivered, and they're the ones that are, are kind of um, uh, orchestrating how uh, service delivery organizations like Cycle Training UK uh, actually deliver it on the ground. So uh, they just launched uh, the bikeability program last year or two years ago. Part of what they'll be doing is uh, benchmarking and, um, and, uh, and best practices for, uh, for that whole thing. The um, cycling proficiency training is what, their, uh, what the old program was, 1936 which was the kind of cones in the, in the playground thing. They were trying to get beyond that and, um, and, and really get people to make good decisions as they're, as they're riding, uh, as I mentioned. The fellow there said that York is the Copenhagen of Britain. So if you're going to plan to uh, travel in Britain and you want to check out uh, cycling, that's, that's what I've been told, that York is the place to go. Uh, we visited uh, Cambridge, and that was pretty, pretty interesting as far as parking and some local policy goes. Uh, one of the things that CTC does is they uh, produce a very high quality uh, magazine. comes out uh, six or eight times a year. It's as good or better than our, uh, you know, bicycling magazines. Uh, and they have some uh, newsletters. And if you're a, a member of uh, CTC, I think you really feel like you're kind of in the loop nationally. Uh, they uh, publish guides, uh, cycling guides, and uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting organization. So Cycle Training UK, any questions before I move on to this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They have uh, several offices around the country. I visit kind of a branch office that's near uh, London, but they have, certainly they have um, different offices in the four countries, uh, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and uh, England. And um, I think they have local chapters as well, sm kind of smaller scale. You get your check mark for the day? Question? <laughs> yeah? Uh, well, that's a good question. The, um, CTC funding, they've got uh, 70 members. It is a membership organization, so they get that. They get uh, some funding that's distributed by uh, Cycling England, and then, uh, which is the government kind of consortium. And then uh, as a charitable organization, they get uh, support from a lot of 
uh, trusts and um, contributions that way. But they do provide, the, I think, a big part of their um, uh, spiel is the bikeability scheme. So they get a certain, you know, uh, stream of revenue for all of everybody that gets trained, basically, because they're kind of the administrative body for uh, for training. And how about do they, do they use the schools for like local school districts as a um, kind of an outreach channel to set up these programs? That's the most common, and I'll talk about that a little bit with the, in this next section when we talk about cycle training. But yes, for bikeability, uh, most of the students get trained through uh, the schools coming to an organization like Cycle Training UK and asking them to train. And they have target years, it's like, I forget what year, it's like fourth grade and then you know a refresher at sixth grade or something like that. Uh, so most of it, as far as students go, uh, happens at school. And then uh, they've got custom programs that they'll, you know, bring to you individually. You can go and meet them or, or they'll have uh, local classes through community centers and that sort of thing. Anybody else? So Cycle Training UK is, like I was mentioning, is one of the service providers uh, that uh, their mission is to uh, promote cycling as a sustainable form of transport. And they feel like the best way to promote cycling is to teach people to use their bikes safely and with confidence. And confidence is, uh, I mean, they mention that a lot. David Dansky is the fellow that I met with there, uh, very interesting and capable uh, person right near uh, Waterloo Station is where their uh, office is. One of the interesting things about this organization is that it's a workers' co-op. And one of the things that uh, their, their goal is to have 1,500 trainers that are making a living wage teaching people to you know, ride bikes as a career, not as something that you do on the weekend or you, know, you kind of fit into your schedule, but you know, as a career thing because it's, it's rewarding and it pays well enough to actually uh, support people. Uh, a couple of statistics, 81% of the trainees, they do a lot of follow-up kind of survey work. So lots of the trainees say that uh, they cycle more often and more confidently, which one would hope they would, since that's what their mission is. But um, <clears throat> it's a, a co-op, uh, an employee uh, co-op. Um, they, they really work closely with... Um, CTC and the development of the bikeability standards, uh, and and it, it's surprisingly similar. I'm I'm a league certified instructor, although I haven't done a lot of it, but I did go through the certification program. Which, by the way, there's one coming up in Eugene in February. If you're interested, League of American Cyclists is doing some training. Anyhow, uh, their curriculum is very similar to our LCI training here in this country. But one of the things that they do is uh, through um, Cycle Training UK, oops, uh, they provide uh, insurance for their trainers, which uh, the League of American Cyclists also does insure. Uh, they've got a really kind of neat um, instructor's manual, kind of cycle training guide, and uh, it really goes through all of the things that you really kind of want to learn to do and do right, or on the left side of the road in England, <clears throat> as a cyclist. Yeah. So, uh, Steve, um, since you're a, a certified instructor, do they have a different, less Forrester-esque focus? Or is well, that's interesting. No, they're really, um, they're really. Uh, Todd Boulanger asked if it's a less Forrester-esque uh, kind of training program or a approach to cycling. And um, Forrester is a fellow here in the U.S. that uh, really uh, feels that we should not segregate cyclists from vehicles and the use of the roadway. Uh, they're actually uh, pretty aggressive in at least Cycle Training UK in training people to take the lane. 
and to get out there and be confident in traffic. Uh, so, and this was the fellow that actually said that, you know, uh, uh, we don't really care about infrastructure. Somebody else can deal with that, and when it comes, it'll be great, but we're much less concerned about, um, you know, whether there's actual infrastructure out there. So, one of the things that, you know, I asked him about was, this is, they've got a bunch of postcards that they, you know, send out, uh, cycling with confidence, and there is not a helmet in sight, which is kind of interesting. So, you know, I had a, a question I baited him with, um, you know, well, what about, what about uh, helmets? And, you know, I guess we'd get into a big discussion there if you wanted to, but maybe we'll put that one off. So I'm just putting up on the board the uh, postcards and kind of brochures that, um, that they hand out to talk about uh, cycling and really trying to get people to feel comfortable out on the road. Now, they do have a lot of uh, quieter roads in the countryside, but they're often connected by pretty busy, fairly narrow roads. So you really do, if you're going to ride in the countryside, you really have to have, uh, be a little bit bold in some places to make good connections. And in the city itself, the traffic speeds are often, in the central city anyhow, relatively uh, slow, but there are people that are very aggressive. The drivers in general, I think, don't have an awareness or much care about pedestrians in particular, I found. And, uh, well, we can get into that whole thing sometime. Yeah. I think it's very similar to here. Um, I think he said, I think David Dansky mentioned that maybe 25 or 27 percent or something like that of cyclists are, of regular commuters are women. So this is obviously sort of part of a campaign to try yeah. to get more women on. Right. Right. And that's kind of an interesting thing, too. Uh, we'll talk about that in the London cycling campaign. Uh, there's actually. Uh, Part of the London Cycling Campaign is very explicit, trying to get out to all sectors of the community, and they actually mention minorities in particular, but they don't men mention uh, gender, you know, trying to even uh, off the gender thing. But you're absolutely right. If you look at, we'll talk about the London Cycling Campaign in a little bit, but um, getting kids on bikes in general is one thing, and then uh, minorities is another, is another thing. So we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about the London Cycling Campaign. One of the things that uh, Cycle Training UK does, sorry about bouncing around there, but let's do that. Um, sorry about the glare on it, but <clears throat> uh, they also do maintenance training, for especially for youth, but to get kids interested in um, maintaining and taking care of and building bikes. So they're trying to build an industry to a certain extent as well, which is kind of interesting. You know, we've got a lot of um, uh, emphasis right now in Portland on the economic benefits of the cycling industry, and I really didn't hear much of that um, in England as far as, and they have a great, you know, bicycle building uh, tradition. and. We did not see a lot of uh, interesting or unique accessories, for instance, or there are a lot of work bikes and a lot of folding bikes, but there's, th there wasn't, I didn't see a lot of innovation in the kind of cycling um, hardware part of the industry. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to, back to that. So we looked at a couple of these things, including the uh, cycle training, cycling with confidence, the bike ability. This thing is really cool, and I had to work really hard. A couple of you saw this at the transportation kind of brown bag I did, but um, I had to work really hard to get my hands on this because I didn't happen to have time to go out for a ride and take a test with the fellow that controls these. Um, You've really got to, they, they don't even give them out to the press unless they actually go through training. So this is kind of my, oh, sorry about that on the microphone. Um, 
But, all right, so they're really trying to encourage uh, getting people out uh, with confidence into the bikes. So here I have to show off where I actually have one of the pins that I've got all three of the pins. There are three levels in bike ability, uh, you know, sort of starters, kind of little kids, getting them out, being able to just stay on the bike. Uh, the second level is a little bit more kind of capability and maybe you can get to school and back and cross on quiet streets and that sort of thing. And then the third is really the commuter more mature uh, cyclists, and and it's really a marketing campaign as well as a training campaign. They they have this really cool little kit and little uh, we can pass it around these pins. You know, are nice little um, kind of enamel pins that uh, you know people are really sort of proud to have and to wear wear around town. Any questions about that, cycle training? Because I'm going to move away from cycle training now. Uh, hang on just a second. Just remember you use microphones. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is sort of related to that. Um, I'm wondering, is there anything like municipal bicycling laws you know, or licensing or anything of that sort? Municipal um, bicycling laws or licensing. You know, I'm not sure about that. There's obviously uh, lots of local policy related to building infrastructure. There, uh, I, I don't know what the kind of English uh, traditions are for different traffic laws from one jurisdiction to another or if they have a kind of national traffic law thing. I'm not sure about that. But they do have different policies on provision of facilities and the design of facilities. And like here, uh, you know, the, even within London, which is one kind of regional municipality, there are these 30 boroughs, which are basically cities, and each of them could have and often do have different approaches to how they would solve the same transportation problem for non-motorized traffic. So in one part of town, you'll see a very aggressive separation of cyclists into cycle tracks, we call them. In another part of town, it's like, let's do a bus bike lane and that and call it good. Uh, Roger. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you ever saw anybody wearing one of those pins around town. I saw a couple of them, yeah. Yeah, that's sort of chest thrust out, yeah. You mentioned training the cyclists. Is there much being done to train vehicle drivers to ah. deal with bicycles safely? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, the question was uh, training for cyclists. Is there much going into uh, vehicle drivers? There's a lot going into uh, heavy goods vehicles, HGVs they call them, lorries, trucks we call them here. So there's a lot going into uh, trucks because that's a huge problem uh, for pedestrians and cyclists in Europe in general and in Britain in particular. So there's that. I don't know if there's, uh, I think there is some uh, initiative to include awareness of pedestrians and cyclists and vulnerable roadway users in uh, auto training. Um, <coughs> You know, uh, as kids are learning to drive, and they have a really, really much more complicated and comprehensive uh, licensing program for drivers, for new drivers in, in England. We're really lucky. Get your international license before you go. We're really lucky to be able to drive there because they have very rigorous kind of training programs. And it's like, you know, there are these big manuals, and there are probably three or four different levels of training for drivers in England as, as well. You get, you know, a provisional license, and anyhow, it's much more complicated than here. So I think they do for uh, the car drivers. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, even though there wasn't much of an emphasis for adult helmet use, did you see children wearing helmets? Yeah, we did see some uh, children uh, wearing helmets, and we could talk about that for a little bit if you want. The issue with helmets isn't so much that it's, it is or isn't safe. It's that, uh, at least as far as CTUK, the trainers go, uh, it's another threshold, it's another kind of impediment to getting people out cycling. Their thought is that uh, if we make it happy and, you know, easy and carefree to go cycling. We'll get more people out there than if we make people afraid and make people or encourage or f make people feel like they have to have helmets and lights and lycra and whatever else and expensive bikes. If we just kind of make it like, you know, going to the tap and getting water, we're going to have a much more payback, much greater payback in health benefits 
uh, from that than the kind of detriment of knocking a few people off because they hit their head really hard. So, you know, and I, I think we're getting, I, I, th I think maybe we've got a, ha a happier medium here. People are, you know, buying helmets and wearing them. I think it's really important. But I also see the point about if it's, if it's keeping some people from getting out cycling, either because they don't own a helmet or because they think, even if they did, it, just because we see so many people out there, it must be dangerous. Uh, I think we're getting, they're, they're getting people out that, you know, wouldn't get out if they thought it was dangerous. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You had another question too, didn't you? Um, it was just going back No, it's not mandated. It's uh, because they have to pay for it. So it's uh, the question was: Is the training for kids mandated in the schools? No, it is not mandated. Is there a, can they quote a certain percentage of schools? Is it across the country? Yeah, they've got um, they have uh, goals, and I can't remember what they are, but it's pretty impressive numbers of students and percentages of students certain age that they intend to uh, teach every year. And then with the refresher course uh, in, you know, a couple of years later. So it, it's, I didn't write that number down in my notes, unfortunately, but it was very impressive uh, numbers of kids that they were trying to get out there. And, and think about it, if they're going to have, if, if CTUK, which is just one of the many providers, the largest one, but if they are hoping to have 1,500 full-time instructors, uh, and they can, you know, probably handle 12 to 18 kids each for however long they do the classes. You can you could run through a lot of kids. You get a lot of kids, uh, you know, uh, oriented in, over the course of a school year. And it's important too that the the schools that they have signing up are uh, the first ones are are ones that have had a tradition of training kids since 1936 or whenever they had their original program. So they've got this real tradition and, you know, it's sort of like Christmas, you know, the memories that, uh, or like prom or something like that, people have very fond memories of their cycling classes, I guess. So it's like it was one of their life passages, one of their, you know, big life passages of the year that they got to do their their cycle training, which is pretty neat. You know, it's like, all right, kids, I'm old enough to do training this year and go do bikes and then I can, you know, ride to school and know how to take care of it and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, eventually. Kim. Steve, you talked about um, a drive to get younger kids on bikes. Is there, what is the age range? Or is there any education directed at older adults? Yes, the bike ability program has, uh, and CTUK has uh, an, an initiative to uh, work with employers and cities, and then also you can call them up and arrange for your own, you know, knitting group to have a class, or uh, or even an individual. If you just you want to learn to ride, you've never ridden a bike before, and you want to do it, you know, in the privacy of your backyard or something like that. You can you can arrange for that. And they also have a program which is kind of interesting that. Uh, I've heard a little bit about here. I'm not sure if anybody does it here. Maybe Todd does actually. Uh, but uh, uh, we've done in uh, in Spokane, or I've seen people do in Spokane and Minneapolis, where you uh, accompany people uh, commuting by bike. So you kind of meet up, and it's sort of like the bicycle school bus that you know the kids put together in Southeast just on their own. It's kind of interesting. But anyhow, where. Somebody who's a capable bicycle commuter will meet up with you somewhere along your trek and, you know, help you figure out the best way to go and give you tips and just, you know, it's a confidence building thing. So that's kind of neat. You had a question too. Do the trainers provide the bicycles or does it actually have access to the bicycles? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that. Um, of course, here the Community Cycling Center provides bikes and uh, some of our... Uh, other you know, training programs provide bikes. The Community Cycling Center here is great because kids can go and do the maintenance program and own the bike afterwards once they take a little you know, test after they've figured out how to you know, put it together. Um, so that's kind of neat, but I'm not sure what they do in anyone. That's a really great question. Yeah, and way in back. Um, does the, uh, is there a 
a backlash kind of against cycling on the part of motorists and all of this attention um, and money is being spent on cycling. We ought to just chuck it and build more roads, um, which is a pretty prevalent attitude here. I can't imagine that, actually. Um, yeah, sure, there is. And, you know, in England, in London, We'll talk about this a little bit on the London cycling campaign. London has uh, congestion pricing. They've got you know places in London that if you drive into it, you have to pay dearly, you know, to drive in and out. And um, 25 pounds for bigger cars right now per day. That's a lot of money. So anyhow, so there's a lot of revenue going in there. But uh, there was uh, kind of an interesting brouhaha in the. Um, news in England just before Christmas where some member of parliament blurted out, he was a radio personality, and blurted out a really, you know, terrible kind of incitement to, you know, violence for, towards cyclists and that kind of thing. And there was a big backlash. And it was sort of like Imus, you know, the guy had lost his radio show and had to apologize <coughs> and stuff like that because of, you know, what he said people should do to cyclists. But um, sure, there's there's definitely that kind of, you know, feedback. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, the infrastructure um, in London or in England is partially funded by cyclists themselves. Does the government provide the infrastructure as well? Well, actually, I would say most of it is provided by uh, uh, tax general tax revenues, not just on, you know, cycle-related things, and lottery funds. Uh, I wouldn't say that there's uh, any sort of taxation on cycling. Uh, there are these membership organizations that uh, conduct their programs and do their lobbying and so on with uh, cycle donations and memberships, but I don't think there's a lot of infrastructure being built with funds that are extracted directly from cyclists. It's more of a, you know, social program like it is here. Uh, Steve, clarification. You have yeah. a pretty stiff VAT tax. That's right. And then you know, programs to give some of that back through employers. Too. So the value added tax in um, in England is is really stiff. You're right. And I'm not sure how that gets, re you know, redistributed back. Maybe you've got a second you can give us the sound bite on that? Um, regarding redistribution, I'm not sure, but they do have programs through employers where the employer will buy the bike and then lease it back to the employee right. if they commute, uh, and you can have some 50% cost savings. Right, yeah, there are great incentives that way for buying uh, bicycles and to encourage people to use bikes that way. Um, we should do a little bit more, but if there's uh, questions on... All right. So the London cycling campaign, this gets us really close to home now. Charlie Lloyd was the fellow that we met with, uh, and um, they've got a whole bunch of campaigns. Uh, th they're really, this is sort of like the BTA to a certain extent, uh, except, you know, in a much larger uh, city. They're kind of watchdogs on bills that are moving through uh, uh, local jurisdictions. They're big on safety, so heavy goods vehicles, HGV mirrors, and this actually appears twice here. You can see the uh, lobbying for safer lorries. Uh, 400 people, it says, lose their lives by getting run over by lorries, mostly turning uh, lorries. So they're big on mirrors, uh, in increasing the use of, uh, or you know, installing mirrors. And one of the problems there is that uh, the way the legislation is currently written, it only has to, they only have to be installed on trucks that are newer than 2,000 the year 2000. So older trucks wouldn't have to be retrofitted. And of course, there are, you know, 70% of the trucks or something like that are older than that. One of the things that I think, uh, you know, our recent tragedies points out is that, uh, and they do have in England, is um, side bars that prevent or at least reduce the likelihood of a truck going over somebody, or somebody going under the back wheels of the truck. It's the same with cars. And I think that's something, it's sort of like a fence thing that goes down next between the front and back wheels would be really important here. Uh, so putting cycling on the tourist map, this is interesting, and it relates to what we were talking about, the greenways, the Olympic uh, greenways. But uh, the full text of that uh, 
putting it on the tourist map says that if it is if it's a program or event that is supported by the mayor, then it should be uh, it should have a real cycle element to it. Uh, access should be uh, you know talked about how you can get there by bike because most of the tourist facilities uh, have brochures and they tell you how to get there by tube or how to get there by cab or to drive. Oftentimes they don't tell you how to get there by bike and where where you can park and that sort of thing. The Olympics is a big deal coming up. Uh, and this is kind of interesting because they have an active spectator strategy. So they, it's not just Olympics for the Olympians, but they're also talking about how you can be an active you know, participant and uh, you know, play a part in getting to the Olympics in an active uh, mode of transportation. Uh, bikes and trains in England, uh, this has really gone downhill, I think, over the, uh, the last several years. They have, um, in England and in London in particular, but they've privatized the rail network in England. And uh, so each railroad is operated by somebody different and they don't all have the same policy and you can't necessarily, you don't necessarily know when you're traveling across the country as a visitor at least, whether you can take a bike on the next train or not. Uh, and if you can, does it have to be in a box and does it have to be taken apart and that sort of thing. And same on the tube, the underground, there are, I've got a map that we might show later that uh, you know, shows sort of when some of the trains allow bikes, but not all of them. So it's really complicated. So folding bikes are much more popular there because of that. Um, powered two-wheelers, that's kind of interesting. That's segways and motor scooters and that sort of thing. Should they be allowed in the bus lanes? That's because the bus lanes in London are bike lanes by default. It's and we've got a kind of a cool picture later on that shows you know how they uh, segregate uh, that and then they just keep track of legislation and the highway code and how um, making sure that adjustments they get made don't uh, affect have a negative effect on a cyclist so I showed this at the brown bag seminar uh, one of the things that the London cycling campaign did is they helped to produce this these cycling maps for London for transport for London Here's sort of the downtown area, and if you look at it, that line is from where we are, pretty close to where we are now, uh, over to Lovejoy in the Pearl District. And if you put a few of their maps together, you get from downtown to Beaverton, that's about that same distance. And then the whole set from Portlandia to Forest Grove, that's the distance from downtown where Portlandia is uh, on this map to uh, Heathrow. So you can see the size of the area and the level of detail that they're mapping it at. Of course, they have a much more complicated roadway system in London, too, than our grids. But um, it's just great, great uh, mapping to get around. And we use these um, as pedestrians walking around London um, quite a bit. So that was one of the things that the London Cycling Campaign did, is help to work on the routes and, um, and how uh, and the mapping uh, graphic and the material on it. Just a couple of statistics, 8.1 million people in the London region, about 2% mode share. Some neighborhoods are really high, 10 and 14%. Some of them are almost nothing. Uh, and they think that they have uh, 65,000 journeys a day uh, going by bicycle, just in the London region. And they were disappointed in that. The fellow that I was talking to was disappointed in that number of people. So that's just the thing. So uh, the cycle network, the London cycle network, is one of the big things about the London cycling campaign. And they have this sort of uh, uh, marking system, both on, the, on posts, on signs, and on the street that help you stay with the, with the network alignment it's a little bit sketchy. It's not really very continuous. They are mapped, and you can kind of follow it on the map, but they're really not as continuous as, as they might be, and that's one of the things that they're really working on improving. They do have an off-road uh, network to a certain extent, and you can see the, you know, the graphic there on the left really is a, this consistent sort of uh, numbering system so you can find your way around. 
Uh, one of the things that they're doing, this is the <laughs> photo that I was talking about earlier, and as somebody brought up on training, the uh, London Cycling Campaign uh, is working with uh, the Transport for London, TFL, on a training DVD for uh, bus and lorry drivers. Uh, bus drivers is obviously important because the bus lanes are shared with uh, cyclists. So I mentioned this to Roger a little while ago. The London Cycling Campaign has a manifesto that they've put out. They've got uh, mayoral um, uh, elections coming up this year, and a lot of borough representatives are coming up for election. And they have this manifesto that they've put out, a uh, 10-point manifesto that they're trying to get the various candidates to endorse. And there are pretty specific uh, things here on, you know, speed, traffic crime. They, you know, talk about it as a crime. It's not, you know, traffic infractions or something. Uh, training, uh, making it advantageous for people to uh, uh, walk to and, and cycle, uh, both in time as well as, um, and this is kind of interesting. They're trying to convert one-way streets back to two-way streets or allow two-way operation for cyclists on one-way streets, which is kind of interesting. Um, trying to get a parking, improve the cycle network, the active spectator thing in the Olympics, the Paris-style uh, cycle hire. They actually have a cycle hire program, but it's fairly small in London. Uh, and they made a big deal of uh, Ken Livingstone, who's the mayor, going to uh, Paris to visit, visit their new program. Uh, working on theft, and really they're talking here about you know, making it a police matter, an important police matter to reduce theft, putting it into part of their kind of performance evaluations, uh, and getting a really good tube-style map. Uh, the map set that they have is a little bit cumbersome, but uh, you know, improving the mapping so that you can really use it as an everyday mode of transportation. So you can see they're really aggressive. The LCC is really aggressive in trying to get uh, politics and policy as well as uh, stuff in the ground. They had a huge uh, event after we were there um, called uh, Free Wheel. 80,000 people. They were hoping for about 30,000 people to participate. It was a Sunday. They closed a bunch of streets in sort of a hub pattern, and they had meeting points out in the neighborhoods and the boroughs and people would ride in groups down together and then kind of uh, cycle up and down the Thames on a pretty long uh, uh, route through downtown. They had 80,000 people show up for that. That's sort of like our bridge pedal. <clears throat> so Ken Livingstone is here. The mayor is really a pro bike, uh, although he doesn't actually ride a bike which is kind of interesting. But he did ride here. This is during Free Wheel, and they have some kind of uh, one of those conference bikes where 20 people can ride on one bike. Uh, that was kind of interesting. But he's backing uh, this sort of help yourself uh, bike hire, the sort of thing that we're uh, trying to work on getting here in Portland. Um, so they're really hoping to get that rolling into London. This is the program that they've already got. It's really, I think this is really cool, actually, because here's this little gizmo, this little lock thing that you can just bolt onto an existing bike rack or onto an existing signpost. The kind of level of infrastructure necessary is very simple. And this umbilical cord that plugs into it stays with the bike. It just has a little bungee cord to kind of hold it on the back. And uh, so, like uh, many of the programs in uh, France and elsewhere, it's uh, free for the first half hour and then uh, costs after that. You call in on your cell phone, you give them your membership number, your location, and off you go. I like, I like this system because the infrastructure needs are so simple. Um, and then there are also some businesses. Go pedal. Uh, Simon here will come and meet you wherever you want. These are actually pretty nice bikes, too. They're uh, French bikes built for the rental market. Uh, he'll meet you, give you the bike, rent you uh, helmets if you want them, and then he'll meet you wherever you want at the end of the day or the next day and pick the bikes up again. 
So if you want to take the tube, and this is a great thing about London, you want to take the tube out to Kew Gardens and ride from there out into the countryside, uh, he, he'll, he'll do that. And they're actually pretty, they were really nice bikes. You wouldn't want to climb a lot of hills with them. But. And then this was a uh, business that was just kicking off while we were there. Uh, of course, they used a Prius, so that's you know, really green. Uh, taxi service, and you could basically do the same thing. You could put your bike on the taxi and get taken someplace and then uh, you know, go riding. Or you could arrange to be picked up at the end of the ride and brought home. Or if you got a flat or it was raining or something like that, you could do that too. They were hoping to spread this. This was brand new, and they were hoping to spread this pretty, you know, throughout the whole London uh, region. They do really nice bridges in London. Some of the infrastructure there was really great. Um, and that's really part of the transport for London, and their responsibility is, uh, you know, for really great bridges and infrastructure like this. Uh, we were mentioning earlier the on the road, they really use color and graphics a lot. And that's part of what the whole training program for motorists is about is, you know, what does two red lines mean versus one yellow line or, you know, I don't even know how many different colors and types of lines they have, but they all have very explicit meaning. Uh, so that was a regular uh, bike lane. Bike boxes that we're talking about here in uh, uh, introducing in Portland in the next several months, there's very explicit design criteria for you know, how and where they are. There has to be uh, what's called a leader lane kind of going into it. Um, this looks backwards, but remember they drive on the left side of the street in, uh, in England. And they have places where you're not supposed to get caught in traffic. That's what that uh, yellow cross pattern is. It means don't get stuck there when the light changes. I liked this one. This was taken from uh, a bus. The little sign there, think bike. That's uh, because there's a conflict point there where you know, a cyclist has to get through this intersection. And the uh, big legend in the red lane over there says, a bus and bike only. So you can see many different kind of colors of, uh, of pavement that they use there. There's the same cyclist looking over his shoulder. Oh yeah, can't you see this? Uh, no, this is uh, red, and these are yellow lines on the side. Ah, isn't that great? Those are, look out! <laughs> um, they're leading up to a stop sign, or a stop light, you know, traffic light, uh, and usually at uh, crosswalks. So it really is, you know, oh my God, look out. Um, they really get into channelizing pedestrians. That's what this kind of fence is all about. And you can see one of the uh, folding bikes. Bromptons are really popular there. Uh, and those, a folding bike you can take onto any tube. And you can take up into your office and that, that sort of thing. Uh, we saw a lot of people just, this bus line, this is a very busy uh, road uh, near uh, Baker Street Station. And um, cyclists basically take that lane and the bus can be just within feet behind, feet behind him, but uh, it's really, they're permitted to be in that lane. Yeah? Uh, Steve, um, in Paris the bike lane, the bike and bus lanes are generally I think 16 feet wide. These look pretty much like 11, so there's no room to really pass. Right. Right, and that's uh, an important thing. Uh, Todd was asking about uh, lane width. Um, in Paris, they're, uh, they're wide outside lanes so that somebody could get by. In London, they're a typical lane width, and the cyclists are really encouraged to take the lane. You could see in this previous, this is where uh, the cycle training, where bikeability teaches you to be in this lane is you know, you're not getting around me and thinking that you're staying in this lane. If you're going to pass me as a vehicle, you got to change lanes and get around. Now, I, we did see, like, the fellow looking over his shoulder, oops, back here, uh, and we did see some people that were hugging pretty close to the left side of the road, to the curb side of the road, and, you know, buses were, were trying to pass them, thinking that they're going to stay in the same lane. And, you could really see why you should be really taking the lane. Uh, this was one that was just really freshly done. This, this is red, if you can see that. 
Now this has, if you can see on the upper left, the blue, on the left edge there, that blue sign has a bus symbol on it. Let's see if this works. Yeah, has a bus, a bike, and that word says taxi. And that line there means that this is a bus lane on the left, and it says down here, all, or at any time. And then this is bus lane cameras. So right up there, there's a camera looking at this, and if you're driving in that lane as an automobile, you're probably going to get a ticket in the mail pretty soon after that. So they do have, um, you know, different times when there are buses, when the bus lane is open to other traffic, but I don't think those would be painted red. I think they're, you know, rush hour lanes, basically. And in that case, it would say on a sign like this what the... Uh, what the system was when you were allowed to be there. All right, so quickly we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some other infrastructure. This is in, near the uh, train station in Cambridge, bicycle parking, and it really is chaos. You'd have to have a bright orange bike to find your bike in there, I think. Um, but they also in Cambridge have a parking garage that's at least a good portion of it is dedicated to uh, bicycles. You don't have to pay. They've got lockers uh, that you could rent for longer periods. Of course, Cambridge is a big university town, so they've got a bazillion bikes all around town. Uh, they have bike uh, parking just, you know, right in the street. In London, they also make very interesting use of some sort of leftover spaces for parking, and they created places created parking opportunities in places that would otherwise be left over, like this island in the, in the street, and, um, and same here. Some of these are pretty busy streets. This, this street is uh, Knightsbridge, in, in Knightsbridge, and it's a pretty busy, you know, retail uh, street. And uh, you can see the bike lane here is green on the left. There's parking there. There are places where uh, bikes aren't particularly welcome, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier on the on the tube system. It's really difficult to figure out, you know, what and when. The the green lines on here ha are this is all the tube system. The um, bright white line is the Thames River, and then the other white lines are other you know tube systems. So the green lines allow cycles some of the time. So you can see there are, you know, little stretches in there, mostly through the center, where it's often not possible to, to cycle. And I never really did figure out what the, what the whole system was on that. All right, so one of the other things, just one more deal. One of the interesting things that London Cycling Campaign did is uh, they produced this series of, I think there are 14 uh, different brochures very from very basic, you know, buying a bike, how to uh, beat the congestion charge, uh, and also this one talks about how to take advantage of the tax advantages, getting started, uh, traveling on uh, the tube and trains, guide for employers and employees, how to make your uh, workplace, you know, happier to. So. They've got a really great sort of system. The London Cycling Campaign has a great sort of system to try to encourage people to ride their bikes. So, yeah. Use the microphone. All your pictures are sunny days, no rain in any of them. Do you have any idea how, how fewer people ride in the winter when it rains in London? Yeah, that's a really great question. The question was how many, if, uh, if, fewer people ride in the rain in London. And I got the sense that um, the commuter level stays relatively, you know, level, but I'm sure that it drops off, you know, when it's cold and wet, sort of the way it does here. But, you know, here, uh, we've got bike jams right now this week. You know, I was riding home the other night and there were you know, people all the way up and down the blocks ahead and behind me. So, and think about some of the incentives that they have in, in London also. 
that are there all year long, the congestion pricing and the congestion in general. And one of the things I really make a point of is that if your trip, if your journey is less than about five miles in London, you're going to get there in half the time by bike than you would by any other mode. Uh, walking is probably the next fastest way to get five miles or shorter. Even the tube is often, you know, really plugged up. And it's not cheap, you know, to ride the tube. Even with uh, passes, it's not all that cheap. And driving, even if you were willing to pay the price, and even if you had a parking place at the other, at, you know, both ends of it, uh, driving is uh, time consuming as well. So there are incentives, regardless of the weather, uh, I'm sure that it drops off, and there might be some fanatics that only come out when it's, you know, inclement. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I have two two observations. One was I didn't see a lot of parked cars next to the bike lane, which is very different right. than what, what what we have here. And I like to know how you see that fitting into the bike safety. The other thing is I've I've heard that all this painting is is fine conceptually, but when you have studded tires and the cost to the city of laying down this, this paint, I've, yeah. I've heard from, from you know, PDOT that they would prefer not to lay down a lot of paint because yeah. then it creates maintenance. Yeah. Can you the, comment on those? Um, the parking, first question was about parking, and you know, I kind of close my eyes and I don't really see a lot of parked cars, on the arterials at least, in uh, London. There are on the back streets, obviously, and most of the back streets are like our bicycle boulevards. They really don't have bike lanes in them. So uh, there were some places where there were uh, bike lanes adjacent to parked cars, but it's really not that common a situation. And uh, that's one of the biggest hazards that I'm looking for when I'm, you know, cycling around town uh, is, you know, car doors. I've had a couple of close calls, but actually not as many as you'd think. I think a bigger thing is, uh, a bigger hazard can be uh, people pulling out from side streets. And if you're in a bike lane, you're pretty close and not as visible as cars are that are out further. But, so that's one. And the other was uh, about the colored lanes and the, and the painting and so on. Most of it actually isn't paint, of course. It's uh, plastic or thermal plastic <coughs> that's kind of melted down onto the street. They don't have studded tires. I think that's a big, you know, challenge here. Um, but they really put, lay down a lot of colored pavement in, uh, you know, in England. And I, th I think it's kind of overdone. It's the, one of the things that they're talking about in some countries in Europe, and they're doing in a on a couple of streets in London is naked streets where they're taking away all the stripes and all the signs, and you know, it's sort of, it's chaos theory to a certain extent. And I think there's some. Uh, I think there's some great, you know, those, there are some great ideas there that deserve a lot more research. But by saying that, by striping and signing and so on, that you have a right to do whatever you want within this thing. And if somebody by accident happens to be in front of you, it's their problem is basically what, you know, stripes and, and colored things are saying. I, I think that's kind of problematic. It takes away people's responsibility for what their own kind of actions are. Now, that said, there are a couple of places where I think that colored uh, pavement and boxes are really important. I think the blue lanes, and I think in part because they are unique, they draw attention to this thing. Like these long uh, red lanes, you know, it's all red so it doesn't really change. I think our blue lanes are really important and I, to, to use that system and the bike boxes are really important. And I think, by the way, blue is the right color for it. But there is something over here. Because it's a vulnerable road user, it's an expression of a vulnerable road user as well as being more visible than the other colors. There, yeah, Roger. Um, it, the, uh, the Cycling England was formed pretty recently, and I'm wondering if you got a sense of what the impetus was for forming such a high level policy. Group. I don't know what the impetus was. Uh, it was formed recently, but it's sort of a rebranding or reconstitution of something that goes back further to that strategy board. And I think, I presume it's uh, for the, you know, kind of good mission of coordinating the interests of, all, of these many uh, agencies to help promote uh, that, you know, cycling as a thing. So it's making use of, it's coordinating and trying to make the most efficient use of their funding and policies. 
Yeah, I can just follow up with that. Did you, did you get a sense that the uh, government agencies, the non-governmental agencies, the advocacy groups all played well together? I think they, yeah, in general. I, you know, at the end of the day, I think they have, <clears throat> they all have the same uh, mission. Roger's question was, do, pay, do the agencies and non-government uh, agencies and so on, uh, organizations play well together? And I think they do, although they have different priorities and they, uh, you know, push things a, a little bit differently and you could sense a little bit of tension between some of them, but, you know, they have the bigger picture idea of trying to get people, more people bike, biking more safely more often. I think any one of them, any of those organizations would uh, subscribe to that. And how they go about it and who gets funded first and that sort of thing is sort of a competition that they have to kind of fight with each other about. But I, I got the sense that they were all very supportive of each other and that they didn't feel like they were being redundant of each other, that they, this is our mission, we're going to support you and so on, but this is really what we're doing and, and people seem to respect each other's sort of uh, interests there. So um, our clock up there is slow and we're about two minutes before our end, so I'm going to have to sort of cut things off even though I know there's a lot more questions and we had some on the web that we aren't unfortunately able to get to, though I think you may have covered them. I want to um, thank Steve, but before we um, really thank him, I'm also going to put in a plug for next week's seminar, uh, the topic being psychological insights on transportation mode choice. Um, it's the result of a dissertation that was done here at PSU recently um, that did involve um, talking to bicycle commuters um, as part of that. So. Uh, a lot of you here might be interested in that as well. And thank you very much, Steve, for coming here today. Thank you.